And that is part of the fitness or high performance experience. It's not just about stressing an individual out, it's about how do you engineer stress and recovery. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast, where we discuss a very different vision for the future of the fitness industry. Today's guest has consulted with some of the biggest brands in fitness, sharing his passion for movement with audiences from the likes of Equinox, Microsoft, and Nike. As CEO of the Institute of Motion, inventor of the Viper Pro, and co-founder of PTA Global, he's spoken at hundreds of conferences on becoming unbreakable. Whilst I thought I was very much in touch with the fitness space, it was great to meet a guest like this one that challenged my thinking and certainly opened my mind to many of the great opportunities that still exist within the fitness space. I think you'll really enjoy this conversation, so please tune in to this week's podcast with fitness visionary and innovator, Mr. Michel Dalcour. So Michel, thank you for inviting me back to yeah. Solana Beach. Great, it's nice to have you back. I was just saying off camera, it was the uh, last time I was here, it was, you were probably, I, I think, my, about my third interview. Little little had, microphone. We had construction going on in the background. It was, yeah, it was nice. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm glad to be back and have the opportunity to talk to you again. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, it's an interesting time and um, I don't want it, all of our podcasts to sort of be about COVID, but as one of the things I wanted to talk about is becoming how to be unbreakable. Yeah. And um, it was just interested to sort of get your views on, you know, as a health expert i guess you know what what's your views on on covid and um you know and and sort of the state of the, you know how would you describe what's what's happening at the moment yeah obviously you know a, a tenuous time to be sure and i think what it's done is it's steered a lot of people towards the idea of how can i perhaps increase my ability to be resilient and it's really shone a light on that and so you know what we've often done is is taken a look at at us as human beings, right? We go through the aging process. We can't stop that, but we can certainly affect our, our journey through the aging process. And one thing that we've tagged into is this idea of being unbreakable, which on its surface is, is pretty aspirational, right? Because if you go to a young person and say, we want you to be unbreakable and they're an athlete, to them, that means on the pitch or on the field doing what they love to do. Uh, if it's in, you know, kind of, let's say, uh, the working person's years, uh, unbreakable may be the capacity to play with kids or to still engage in recreational sports and feeling youthful and, and achieving certain things. And then in our older years, it may not be popular, you know, to post that on Instagram. But in my estimation, what's equally sexy is the 87-year-old that can live an independent life. And that to that person, that's on being unbreakable. Hmm. And so the idea of being unbreakable is to kind of bend or yield without breaking. And a lot of that is, uh, you know, some of it is genetics and some of it is our lifestyle to be sure. But some of that is, you know, what we choose to do as it relates to training and to recovery and hmm. things that we can participate in, in an active way. And we can decide for ourselves, right? Genetics, maybe not, but we can decide for ourselves what we choose to do and how we choose to do those things so that we can undulate a better, you know, a physiological or, or, or biological result. Mm. And we kind of call that, you know, trying to be unbreakable. And, uh, and so a lot of thought goes into it, a lot of programming thought and a lot of science goes into it. Mm. Do you think that prior to this, that people, I know I, I did, but do you think in general people that weren't fitness or health minded felt that they probably were unbreakable? And, and, and now they're starting to realize, oh, you know, actually, if I'm carrying a bit of weight and not eating healthy, that, that, you know, there's probably more immediate consequences as opposed to sort of long term ones that just seem too far in the future. You're probably right, because there's more immediacy now, isn't there? Right. When we look at the idea of if comorbidities, right, if I if I hold uh, some additional dis-ease in my body and then there is something that is a clear and present danger uh, that is circulating and circulating very broadly through our society, we all stop and we think about ourselves and we think about those that we love. And then we say, we take account into that, right? What do we do? What can we do uh, to be able to make sure that I'm well and make sure that those that I love are safe mm -hmm. as well? And so I think you're right. It does, uh, it, it does require that we take a pause and then we take into account what we are doing. Some of the confusing part, though, is that there's so much information out there, Matt. And, you know, if I'm an accountant 
and I'm trying to, let's say, create a better health outcome, and I'm hearing about magnesium, and I'm hearing about sleep strategies, and I'm hearing about you know, the right type of workout and the right type of nutritional profile, I could well imagine that that is a very difficult position to be in, knowing that you've got all these sound bites that are floating up, and I don't know how to make sense of all these sound bites. And I would say that, particularly in fitness, fitness and fashion are, to a certain degree, trend-based. In other words, there's certain thought processes that begin to take over. And they hold the oxygen in the room, and it seems as though in that period of time, that's the only thing that is important. Mm. And what we try to do is we try to take a, a more measured look at that and say, all right, that may be true, but... You know, systems biology, which is our body and its infinite complexity, can do a lot of different things or have a lot of different pathways to reach a similar result. Mm. Uh, so what begins to percolate from this idea of um, kind of trend-based thinking is sound bites, right? Inflammation is bad, mm. right? Don't do aerobic exercise because it kills your gains. Sitting is the new smoking. These are sound bites. And they don't reflect the true nature of our bodies uh, and how we can navigate health and the healthy experience through our life. Mm. Mm. Do, do you think as a, and I'm, I'm using the word fitness industry, it's a very broad statement, but I think most people who are listening probably understand what I mean. But do you think the fitness industry has, um, you know, in terms of the goal that most of us are selling, do you think that we've probably incorrectly defined what we should be moving to in general. So I'm talking about the difference between us that are within this fitness space. You know, we've, we're running health clubs with personal trainers. And then you've got the, cons the, the consumer, the people on the street that are sort of, you know, going to one of these places to get what they think they need to get. Right. You know, do you, do you think that what we're, what we're sort of selling is, is, is defined and that is a worthy goal or in terms of you and your company with, with you know, health and human performance, do you have a different definition of what that goal is and should be? It's different for everybody. And as a coach, what we might say is whatever your goal and value set is, if it's important for you, it's important for me as a coach, right? And so what that does is it starts to you know, wash away the idea of, well, I think that you should have this. Mm -hmm. As a coach, I would never say that, right? And I think the fitness industry in general is starting to pivot towards that because, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it was really you go in and you physically change the look of your body. Mm -hmm. And that was the early days of bodybuilding. No judgments on that. I think that that goal is still a primary goal that walks into a gym, mm -hmm. if we're being honest. Yeah. And if that is a person's highest value set, so be it, right? It's not for us to necessarily judge that. If I value the idea of looking good with no clothes on, then I want to probably achieve that for as long as I want to achieve that. Mm. And as a coach, we want to recognize that. But I think to be able to do that, it can't be that alone. I think what a lot of customers are realizing is there's an aesthetic pursuit perhaps, uh, but there also is a... And underlying, can I actually be resilient? Can I feel good? Can I feel good for longer? Can all of these things be part of my health experience yeah. and my fitness experience? Because that's the bit, just to jump in there, that, that's the, so I suppose like you're right, you know, and I get that if you're a coach, it's like, well, what do you want to achieve? And a lot of what I think people want to achieve is what they're being sold. It's true. And, and the media, you know, us as an industry, do a great job at selling that, you know, you know as an example, the recent thing is hit. You need to do hit training because this is what it's going to do for you and it's great for everybody. Um, but as you said, there, there could be a price of just doing hit training all the time. It, you know, if, if, if that's all you do and you probably do it too much, then it, it, it could have other consequences, so just as if you ate, had too much magnesium. Yeah. What, what, if, if we come back to, I suppose, what you would say is like a true north, you know, you work from elite athletes to kind of, you know, 80, 90 year old people, what, what in your mind should be a, a worthy goal of, you know, what, what, what should we be looking at in terms of becoming this sort of unbreakable, which, which I guess is a great thing for us to have, but it's not something I've ever even thought about going, you know, I'm, I'm saying, well, I want to look good. Yeah. Um, but what, 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 what and is, that may be our entry point. I want right. to look good. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm kind of, you know, 
reaching 48 now, so maybe I want to look like I did <laughs> earlier. I don't like the middle section that's expanding or what have you. And so I kind of want what I used to have, or I want to be constantly improving, mm -hmm. right? And so somewhere in that whole experience, uh, we have a pursuit and an activity towards or an engagement towards fitness or health. And I think to us, our true north is we're an applied health and human performance company. And what that really means is that fitness doesn't necessarily equal health, right? So if you look at the athletic population, they're world-class fit and they may not be healthy at all, right? And you look at certain cohorts within athletics and you look at endurance athletes that put a huge amount of volume on their, on their bodies. That's a perfect example because they're now putting so much stress on their body to train for the long duration of their activities that, you know, what happens as a consequence? Well, you know, they, they could disrupt uh, the endocrine balance of their body. If you're the female population, a lot of times they won't have their menstrual cycle for, you know, months or years. And so when you look at the impact on health, not just human performance, but health, then that starts to fill in some of the gaps. And I think what we would want for any individual as they pursue their own journey within health and fitness is the idea of health and human performance. Whatever that means for you, right? Human performance could be at a high level. Mm -hmm. It could be, hey, I just want to be out of pain. It could be, I just want to enjoy my life and activities and still, you know, go out and have, be social and, and partake in what socialness is sometimes when it, it's eat, eat and drink. And so all of these things to us ladder back to the notion of health and human performance. So you use the idea of HIIT training, right? And, you know, obviously it accelerates a lot of physiological processes. But, you know, take for example, if the dosage is of a certain uh, quantity, right? Let's say we're doing high, high dosage of HIIT training or exposing our body to it a lot during a given week. Uh, that may be okay for some individuals, but in achieving high uh, degrees of intensity, we are changing the chemistry of our body through that process of engagement, right? So when we're looking at high intensity exercise, we're using energy at a quick rate. And there's benefit to that for sure. Performance-wise, tremendous benefit. And then what we establish or what we accumulate in the body is these metabolites, right? So I'll get scientific just for a second. Mm -hmm. So we get into an, what's called an acidosis state. So we produce lactic acid, it dissociates in water, and we increase lactate, which is okay because we can reuse that, and we increase hydrogen ion. And when it accumulates in the body, it triggers the production of the anabolic response. So if you were to hear that as a consumer, you'd say, well, Michelle, give me five what of those. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> or, or you might say, anabolic response means I'm getting bigger, stronger, okay. faster. Like, give me some of that, right? <laughs> And, and so that's kind of what we do is we approach that with huge enthusiasm because we know that that's factually accurate. Like the acidosis increases growth factors and it makes you bigger, stronger, faster. And so if we just stop the sentence there, it would be a lovely thing. Okay. But what happens is it also creates, you know, uh, uh, an aging process of the body that accelerates uh, in the short term and perhaps in the longer term, depending on our dose response. It increases cytokine activity like uh, interleukin-6, which is immunosuppressing. So now what is, you're thinking... And what, what would that... Just... So does that, in the short term, that blunts the immune response. Okay. So now you're thinking, all right, in the normal time, you might think, well, okay, maybe more susceptible to colds. In the pandemic time, it might be something completely different. So where right? you've got, like, I suppose everyone or, you know, governments and that say, okay, go, get, get fit, you know, work out. And then people are like, oh, okay, well, there's a so-and-so studio near me. I'm going to, I'm going to get involved in that because you know I need to lose a bit of weight. So, so what I guess with the misinformation, what you can end up having is people going to do that, and then they're actually making probably themselves more susceptible. They may, right? Right. That that could be the, the case because what they're doing in the short term is they're blunting their immune response because of the intensity with which uh, they are engaging in activity. Mm -hmm. And if that perturbation, if that stressor, if that exercise bout is something that is not common, right? They, they haven't been doing that for a large period of time leading up to it. Then that, you know, that input, that perturbation is even of a larger nature. Mm. And so the reaction, the consequence uh, in terms of how the body's recovering from that 
can be even more uh, distinct in terms of its reaction. And when and, you go into a lot of these, you know, I guess when you go into some of these places, it's not like, from my experience, it's not like they're saying, well, look, let me look at your condition. Where are you? Whatever. It's like, okay, yeah, here you go. So I'll do your pack of 10 and, sure. and you're in and it's, it's, it's just seen as kind of exercise as opposed to kind of being a, and I, I'm, I'm in the industry and some of the stuff that you've said is you know some of the stuff I've not heard before I, I kind of know the conceptually so, so I guess you know for the average person that's just not sure yeah. you know they, they, they can be taken down all kinds of paths that are probably doing more a lot, a lot of damage and I let's suppose. go back to our example of we're an accountant now and we're hearing all of these things like hey high intensity is that ex- excellent now you're listening to this podcast and it's like well maybe not that excellent <laughs> so now you're confused yeah. And it's not about binary, it's good or bad. It's really about who we're dealing with. It's really about what their physiological readiness is, right? So, you know, nutrition and, you know, their training history to that point and their overall health profile, right? We stratify all of that and then we stratify the risk. And then we can engage in a, in a, in a way in which it supports health as well as their fitness or performance goals mm. as they can increase or, or they matriculate those experiences out. Mm. And so for us, it really isn't about a fitness experience. It's about a health and human performance experience, but it's also about engineering that for the individual, right? And so uh, an analogy could be this. Let's say you and I are kind of, you know, we're, we're you know, high impact people, let's say. Uh, we're living our lives and trying to achieve as best we can and really striving hard. And what takes a backseat perhaps is you know, the exposure to exercise. Uh, our lifestyle habits maybe not are the best. And so we, we have this and then we've experienced this for some degree of years. And then what we want to do is we want to get back to a healthy position. We want to get back to a healthy uh, goal. And so we, we may lean into an exercise engagement but we may not know necessarily where to start. Mm-hmm. And so the idea is that uh, instead of starting with exercise, we might actually start with recovery. And so that doesn't sound quite like the fitness experience yet, does it? Because like, well, no, I want to start exercising so I get somewhere. So the analogy I might use is, imagine if we're filling our four liter bucket with five liters of fluid that is life. Right. So it's just, you know, work commitments, life commitments, you know, financial commitments, relationship and family commitments. And that five liters of liquid is just overflowing. So what the individual tends to to do now is to say, you know, I feel like I can't keep up. I feel like I'm underwater. I feel like this is too much. And the idea of that individual is, well, let's go and exercise now because now we're stressing (laughs) out a stressed out system. So now we're putting five and a half liters of fluid in a four liter container. So it continues to overflow. And the analogy there is that instead of uh, necessarily adding stress to a stressed out system, what we may do is to say, all right, for Michelle and Matt, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by recovering. So we're going through a recovery process. And that could be hot, cold. That could be light. That could be uh, compression. That can be sleep strategies or napping strategies. That could be all of these things to index higher levels. It could be breathing techniques, all these levels to increase recovery. In this analogy, you're not changing the fluid that's going in. It could be five or five and a half liters. But what are we doing? We're building now not a four liter tank. We're building a six or seven liter tank. Mm. And now we're saying, hey, Matt, now we've just built you or Michelle, we built you a capacity that is increased. Now keep living your life. Because now that five, five and a half liters doesn't seem overwhelming anymore. Mm. It's like, don't worry about it. Just keep living your life. We've given you a bigger tank, Mm. right? And that is part of the fitness or high performance experience. It's not just about stressing an individual out. It's about how do you engineer stress and recovery? And a lot of times what we might do is start off with the recovery. So, you know, for an individual, they might come in and say, well, what's your fitness experience like? Well, I've been going to see my individual and they've, get, they've got me to recover. Well, that doesn't sound quite right. Why? Are you, you're not exercising? No, I'm, we're recovering. Well, why? And in this case, we are trying to index recovery or trying to introduce recovery so that we can actually build capacity within our uh, physiology or biology. Mm. So if, if, say, for example, you're a you know, high-end athlete, would yeah. that... Does, do those same processes, you know, so they're high end athlete, maybe they've had some injuries or whatever. Would, would that, are you using those same principles for someone on that level as well then? Look at, 
look, you know, what is what does Tom Brady, LeBron James, Serena Williams, and Roger Federer all have in common? They all should be retired, <laughs> right? Because they're in the twilight of their career. And they all spend a very either a lot of money or a lot of time recovering. <laughs> all of them. Right? So the soundbite on Roger Federer is he sleeps 10 hours a night and has a two-hour nap every day. Right? That's recovery, right? Tom Brady, what 13 people to handle is recovery. LeBron James spends, I don't know what the number was, but it's a high figure on mm-hmm. recovery. So what they're trying to do is build capacity. And that to us is a, is a pivot from the, in the fitness industry, it's a pivot. Mm. If you study health and human performance physiologically, it's not. Because what you're trying to do is balance out the systems of the body, if you call it sympathetic or parasympathetic, right? And you're trying to balance those out so that you build capacity. And what's interesting about even just general stress is the natural response of the body to stress, any type of stress, is movement and community, right? So if you're under stress, you're going to fight or flee, and you're going to get around other people, right? right? If there's a bear chasing you, you're going to look for another human being to get closer to. What's interesting now is we do the opposite, right? You're stressed at work. I'm stressed at work. We're sitting at a table. (laughs) And we we, we isolate, particularly now with pandemic, we isolate ourselves and we don't move because we're trying to figure out if it's work-related stress, we're working late, we're sitting, we're doing the exact opposite of the natural response to stress, which is to move and to seek a communal situation for protection, right? The the strength of others, if you will. And we're doing the opposite. And And that's not not human. Not resting as well. Uh, You know, I guess that's a, a, a side effect of, you know, when you are stressed, you're not sleeping and not getting your recovery and that's the cascade isn't it right right yeah and so and then you try harder right and sleep is something that you can't try harder to do <laughs> no. right you can't will yourself to sleep but try tonight you know all the viewers right yeah. it's not going to work right so you have to let chemistry just simply take over but chemistry has to undulate relative to a circadian rhythm mm. and so that's what you that's the idea of health and humor phones you undulate and you engineer these types of things so when in terms of the best in the world that are, I suppose, finely tuned machines. And you, you gave some examples there. So how are, are you seeing then that, that these athletes, if they are doing things in the right way, they, they, they have, are having some sort of significant um, extensions to their, their careers and, and, and being able to sustain that performance? Is that all sort of like measurable and there's, there's examples of that out there now, is there? Yeah, and I think when we look at biometrics, right, so you look at all the wearables out there, and then you look at all of the, um, you know, just the, 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 the individual ways in which we can recover. So think of all the technology, the recovery tools that are coming out into the market. Um, it's a thing. And what we're doing as a business is we're saying, all right, if all of these things seem disparate, just like training equipment, mm-hmm. how do you bring it together in a way to program? And so and we've got an educational stream that actually teaches people how to stress the body and how to recover. So we talked about the four Q things, right? So we've got these models that allow us to think about how to stress the body and how to recover in a very pre- precise way. Like what type of recovery mm-hmm. are you going to do for your physiological readiness and your goal? Mm-hmm. Just like you're going to do different forms of exercise for your physiological readiness and your goal. If you're wanting to do better running, you're not going to go and lift a bunch of weights in the gym necessarily, right? And that's not all you're going to do. And so just like trying to elicit a performance outcome that is specific and stressing your body accordingly, the same thing is true with recovery. You're going to recover differently or perhaps differently if you want to lose weight versus if you want to gain muscle. Mm. So, in, in, and we'll come on to the 4Q in a moment then. So in, in terms of getting that concept out um I, I suppose at the moment it sounds like it's a great solution to what many people are dealing with um but there's obviously a requirement to have some sort of interaction with an expert you know i, I suppose if you look at general fitness it's something that's a bit of you know it's quite commoditized you know people are not prepared to pay that much for it i think you'll pay more to have your nails and your hair done not that i would know than to get something that's going to make a difference to your life so in terms of of, of getting the the you know the the industry to that level where people are do see the value and and also people who are working in it can actually sort of get that education mm. to be able to to sell that as opposed to you know we talked off camera about the first thing that's being cut at the moment is training mm. 
How, how do you make that shift? Or do you think that, you know, we've got to look at a different model to, for, you know, maybe for individuals to be able to go out and do that? What, what's your, I don't know, it's a big question. Yeah, but. but I think part of that question really anchors into this idea of, you know, do we have the, do we have a confidence? If we're talking fitness industry, and do we have the capabilities and the confidence to be able to speak to and program for individuals? And if we, if we do, then that is personal training, right? It's, it's, it's specific for the individual and where they want to go and where they're at physiologically. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is to say, all right, if that is the case and we want to make it personal for the individual, what operating systems do we use, right? Because we're big fans of what's called variability, which if there's too much variability, that's noise to the system. But a lot of times the idea of this specificity tends to prevail. But if we think about health as an outcome, it really is about variable inputs, right? So we talked about high intensity training. What we might look at is low intensity training for about as well. And then we might take a look at steady state activity and interval based undulating activity as well, because all of these uh, aspects utilize different fuels, energies within our body. And to the degree that we can pivot from one to the next with ease means that we're more physiologically ready, right? right? And, and nothing's going to rattle our system, so to speak, because we're, we're used to changing from one fuel source to the next uh, because we're, you know, we've been exposed to it. And that exposure, it makes us more resilient, hmm. right? And, and that's the big thing is that we want to expose ourselves to variable stressors. And so another way of looking at it is thinking about what happens in, in relation to the gym, right? So if you took a gym kid and they wrestled the farm kid and you were a betting person, you know, where would a, where would a person's money be? And we, <laughs> we've talked about this before, I know. And most people would say it's on the farm kid. Okay. But if you took that farm kid in the gym and they did linear repetitive action advantage gym kid, right? Because it's where they had exposure. And what we want to do is expose individuals to different stressors. Because to a certain degree, the more stressors that they can be exposed to, the more resilient they are, mm. Mm. right? And so what we want to do is we want to create that idea as a framework for fitness and then have the individuals, uh, the professionals, understand that and then be able to articulate and program that for an audience. Because right now it just follows sound bites, right? Everybody yeah. follows the same trend of the day, which is, I, I, I get it. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily serve the idea of health and human performance. No. And there are a lot of different systems and diets and workouts. And as you say, the fashion thing probably drives that. It's like, oh, okay, well, what's so-and-so, what workout is so-and-so celebrity doing? Oh, she's going to so-and-so cycle studio or something. That's what she's doing. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think, yeah, like I say, even for someone like me that gets to talk to so many people, I'm confused about and that's an what honest, to do. And that's an honest statement, <laughs> right? It's an honest statement because there is a lot of, you know, confluence in terms of the narrative out there. Mm. And it is confusing. And I think what makes it even more confusing is there is a stack of research that may be on two sides of a different equation. <laughs> and where that ends up is something called systems biology. And Matt, what systems biology is, is that our bodies are so amazing that it can take different paths right. to get to the same endpoint. So if we're studying that path and saying, this is the one, this, see, it got from here to there, and this is the path. If we interviewed the body and the body could talk, it would say, well, I can do this path too and get there too. Mm -hmm. And that systems biology makes it even more confusing. Yeah. It makes me think, like I've been talking about it, and for anyone that's followed us over the last few months, is I've been talking a lot about, well, why aren't governments doing more with the fitness industry? Because it's very clear that most of the money's being spent on prevention and the medicine and the vaccines and, and the hospitals. But in terms of reducing the need for any of that type of spend and the, and the hospitals, then if you could, if you could do what you're saying, that that's going to make the world a healthier place. Um, but for whatever reason, governments are not supporting it. They're not necessarily working with a lot of the fitness space. And, it, and when you said this, it kind of almost makes me wonder, um, is that because as an industry, we, we're a little bit confused with really what we are able to do and whether, you know, we are, are we, are we health professionals and we really can help you or are we actually potentially going to risk creating more problems than, than what we've solved? So I, I just wanted, you know, your thoughts on that. You know, are we, are we together enough to have a, 
a, a, a solid argument to say, yeah, you know, come on board here and we'll we'll be part of the solving the problem. Or are we still a little bit disjointed and you know immature and still figuring that out? <laughs> Yeah, and I think that conversation lends itself to both sides of that ledger, right? It is really about the health span in our lifespan, mm. right? And the health span, you know, unfortunately for us, we're going we're gonna to live, the fortunate part is we're going to live on the prevention side of the ledger, hopefully for a long period of time. But at certain points, you and I are going to be ushered into a reactionary care medical model. Mm. And that's part of our health span. What we want to do is delay that as much as possible. And so I think Understanding and recognizing and respecting scope of practice is the idea of a fitness professional is there to coach and assist a fitness and health experience that is more prevention than it is reactionary care. But it is part of the same conversation because we're going to touch on it in at some points in our lives. And I think what we would argue or what we would advocate for is the idea that, hey, if we can actually start to be in the ecosystem right? Interacting with individuals, coaching them and helping them through a prevention uh, part of their, of their health experience. Then the hope there is that we would offset or delay malady and shift, you know, some of the, some of the egregiousness of, of the costs and everything else that the medical model has to bear. We would be able to shift that a little bit. Mm. And so we can do that through health coaching. We can do that through fitness instruction. We can do that through the fitness industry. Uh, and all of those things sit within the prevention arm of our health experience. And that's a very important one. But I think to your earlier point, policymakers, uh, and particularly in our time right now, it's we are reacting to something that is a crisis. And so what they want to see right now is something that can turn the needle very quickly. Mm. And I get that. You know, I think that lifestyle habits and, and physical activity take a while. To, to, to result in a person's body, uh, and they would have a profound impact on a person's health experience. Um, but it takes a while to get there. Whereas a vaccine is tangible, it's real, it can be implemented, and that timestamp could be from that vaccine's implementation and then moving forward. Mm. And so I think there it should be, there ought to be room for both of those conversations as it relates to the human being's health experience or their health span. Mm. And where, where would you start um, in, in terms of this? You know, where, where would be that you're, you're your company or one of your companies is an education company. Um, so I, I guess, you know, you, you train hundreds of thousands of people. Where do you think are the areas that, you know, if you could do it, you would start and, and sort of build upon that to, 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 to sort of raise the level and be able to, I suppose, you know, be able to provide more of this, sort of human performance it's certainly something that, that sounds appealing to me you know i've figured out my tra- I've, I've over three years i've spoke to so many different fitness professionals and i've put together my own and, idea and look at you now and i'm yeah i i'm i physically i i'm yeah i'm obviously in decent shape but it's just you know how, how, how am i probably doing some things that are probably going to catch up with me um i don't know you know maybe i'm not maybe i've just hit, hit a nail on the head but i you know you having a business and working 12 hours a lot of times and not sleeping a lot. I know there's certain things that are not quite right there. Right. So, so, you know, where, so for me, it would be a product that I'd be interested in buying and investing in if I knew, if I had the confidence that I knew somebody really knew what they were doing. Right. And, um, and then, so secondly, you know, where, where do these people exist? Cause I don't know who I'd pick up the phone and speak to apart right. from very few people. Right. And so you'd know a lot of these people cause you've spoken to them, right? But if you're the general consumer, where do I start? And I think that there are certain companies and even club chains out there that are starting to put a, a stamp on this idea of, of high performance. And you know what that means to the individual, it, it might be unique. But what we've done educationally is we, we've just run our first wave of uh, students into a 12-week program. It's a level one program. There's three levels to this process. But really what it is, is it's an applied health and human performance specialist. And where it, where it speaks to in the leveling process is the idea of how to program in its first level, how to program for stress and recovery. That's where we start. And we actually have constructed a, a program builder, right? So just like a workout builder is, that's out there that could count sets and reps and body parts, ours is, is our decision trees uh, and 
the way it's framed is, is different. But fundamentally, it's how do you stress and recover an individual? And how do you put that in a program relative to where that individual is? So in our earlier example, if you and I needed a bigger bucket, right, we would probably uh, undulate higher towards recovery and structure that in our program. So let's say we've structured over two weeks or a month and we've got our months mapped ahead. You might see more work in or recovery days than you do work out days. But we're still doing something almost every day. Mm. But what we're doing is we're trying to build capacity first. Right. right. We're trying to build that bucket. Instead of a four liter bucket, we want that seven liter bucket. Because even if we're still filling it with five and a half liters of fluid, all of a sudden your life slows down, so to speak. Like I can live my life and I feel like I've got capacity for it, which is really not necessarily true of, of all people right now, <laughs> right? If the, the bucket's overflowing. And so our program may look different. It might have a high degree of, of recovery in there. And then over time, when that bucket builds, guess what? That starts to shift towards a lot of stress, mm. right? Relative to what we had before. We still got the recovery in there, but now we're undulating towards stress. And so now all of these stress hormones that make us resilient, all the androgens that you know, put on muscle mass and make us youthful as men, all of these things can actually now be bathed into a system that has the readiness for it, right? Another analogy is the car, right? So a lot of men and women, historically men would go in and lift these heavy weights, right? And so when men and women went into the gym and lifted these heavy weights, that would be akin to revving the horsepower of their engine and building the horsepower of their engine. And that sounds good. And we're going to put a 300, 400, 500 horsepower engine in our car. But if the chassis of our car, <laughs> the brakes, <laughs> right, or the brakes or the, you know, the, you know, just the, the, the you know, the, the structure itself yeah. cannot support that, then what? Yeah. Right. We see that with athletics all the time, right? Soft tissue injuries plague athletes all the time because they get bigger, stronger, faster, bigger, stronger, faster, bigger, stronger, faster in their nerve and muscles, particularly in muscles, but their support mechanism, the chassis, the connective fibrous connective tissue, tissue takes a lot longer to adapt. Mm. So that's now you've got a timestamp that's different. You can rev, you can build your horsepower up quicker than you can develop your chassis. Mm -hmm. So now you've got a 450 horsepower engine in a Ford Fiat chassis, yeah. and it's only a matter of time before that breaks. Yeah. And we see that all the time. And so that is the physical example, but we can take the life example of that as well. And to say, let's just build capacity. Because mm. that build capacity helps us be unbreakable. The, the idea of bending without breaking is flexibility. And we want metabolic flexibility, right? We want uh, mechanical flexibility. We want recovery. We want all of those things in order for us to be as unbreakable as we possibly can be. Mm. Where does that type of education fit into the traditional, you know, sort of level one? You got your, your fitness instructor certification yeah. and your personal trainer. Is this a level on top of yeah. that? We recommend that indiv individuals have some degree of experience, you know, usually six months plus of uh, having some base level knowledge. Mm. Because what we're trying to lo layer over in our level one is the idea of making different decisions. So we go through a, a, a bunch of different decision trees. Right? So as a fitness professional, the first decision is, for Matt, is it a workout day or is it a work-in day? Right? That's my first decision. So let's play that kind of mind, okay. that mind flow for a second. So if it's a workout day, is it mechanical, is it metabolic, or is it both? So let me give you an example. If it's, if it's mechanical, it might be your classic weightlifting session. If it's metabolic, it might be your classic run mm -hmm. right? or different things. And these are simple examples, but to illustrate the point, if it's both, it might be type, a CrossFit type of workout, which is resistance at intensity because there is a metabolic component. Now, we would also agree that every workout has a metabolic influence to it. I get it. But the classic weightlifting session is more geared to, can I have mechanical breakdown because I want to make some gains or I want to get some strength or some cross-sectional area increase in muscle size. Right, so that would be my first decision. Is it a workout or a work in day? If it's and how workout, is that done? How, is is that like a system that you we, still have? We in our program builder, yeah. that is part of the decision tree. So right. we go through these binary choices, right? So the decision tree is workout or work in. Okay, I chose workout. And is that on an app or something? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a web app. Right. And then if I chose workout, is it mechanical, metabolic, or both? So I then choose. Right. If it's mechanical. The next one is, is it muscle-based strength or movement-based strength? And so you'd say, well, okay, what's that? 
Muscle-based strength is today's chest day, today's arm day. Great. You know, all that still rings true if that's, if that's a person's goal. Movement-based strength is something different. It would be things like dead strength, which is picking things up and putting it down, like a deadlift. Right? Uh, it would be odd position strength, which is like that farm kid, right? So everything that's uncommon. Like viper type it, of... Yeah, so anything that is viper-based or a Bulgarian bag or a, a, a sand bell, all the tools that you might have as functional tools in your catalog would be potentially what we call dead strength, right? Or starting strength in the vernacular of the SNC community, right? So the idea of picking things up and putting things down, really important. Odd position, same thing. Now we're gonna, maces, we're gonna load oddly. Viper, uh, we're gonna uh, load oddly. You know, all these different implements, we can start to load in uncommon positions. Strength, endurance, and relative strength are movement-based approaches to strength. So now it's not just maximal strength. We've got six definitions of strength. <laughs> And then we go to power. So all of that is the kind of, it's a workout day, it's mechanical and all the way through. If I said it's workout day and metabolic, we now have our 4Q metabolic thing. Is it, are we doing high intensity? Are we doing submaximal intensity? Is it steady state or is it interval? And when you take those four choices, it creates basically you know, a, a, a cross, if you will. And there are four quadrants within that cross. And so when you look at that, that is either high intensity interval training, that is high intensity steady state, that is submaximal intensity steady state, or it's submaximal intensity interval. So let me explain. Submaximal intensity steady state is you're going for your easy jog. So like when you said you jogged around and take a look at what was happening, uh, that m probably was just, you know, you're going for your cardio, heart rate's under threshold, you're just kind of cruising along. That would be s what we call SIS, submaximal intensity steady state. The benefit of that is you're increasing the ability to take in oxygen and deliver it to cells and muscles. That's wonderful for longevity and it's wonderful for recovery. So right away, there's a benefit to cardio. Right. right. Doesn't kill your gains. I mean, concurrent <laughs> training I get, but there's a time stamp to it that, right? So yes, it'll kill your gains within six hours, but anything, uh, you know, beyond that, there's hardly any interference, but I would argue that interference is actually good. So if you did it within six hours, hallelujah, that it, it, it interfered with your gains. You want that from time to time because interference is fundamentally good. And that's a separate discussion, right? <laughs> Because it makes us more resilient, right? Right. Interference is, you know, something that our body's got to deal with. Mm -hmm. So kind of a separate conversation, but there are benefits to that kind of cardio jog that you did. Submaximal intensity interval training, which is another quadrant, is activities of daily life. So it's submaximal and it kind of undulates. Mm -hmm. So if you and I moved intermittently throughout the day, like the blue zones out there, that helps, you know, uh, every marker of all cause mortality. Every one of them. So that's good for health, the intermittently moving throughout the day. So those are our two bottom quadrants. The upper ones is high intensity interval training, which is HIT, mm -hmm. which is when you have a work to rest ratio of one to four or one to six, meaning you do something all out for 30 seconds or near all out for 30 seconds, and then you rest for two to three minutes. Now that looks nothing like what's, what people are doing right now, but they're calling it HIT, right? The value of true HIT training is in the recovery. So you and I blasted out whatever we're doing for 30 seconds. We hit critical power or near critical power. Then we rest for the next two, three minutes. Why? So we can do it again. And that recovery allows us to reconstitute neural fatigue, metabolic fatigue, get everything back so we can hit it again. That is actually HIIT training. Hmm. But it's been held hostage to what people call HIIT training right now, which is they take the recovery and they shorten it. Hmm. Right. And that's called his training, which is high intensity, steady state where you take the, the, and that's your EMOMs and your AMRAPs and your, you know, your ASAPs and your Tabatas where you take the recovery and you shrink it down. Right. Right. Cause the clock's running or I've got to do it every minute on the minute. And that's cool too. But we call that his training, which is high intensity, steady state. And that's where you flood the body with metabolites, with hydrogen. And that really makes a person bigger, stronger, faster. Right. And when you look at CrossFitters, they all kind of look the same. Yeah. They're all jacked. And that's because of acidosis, acidosis, acidosis. And so you might think that's awesome. And it is for a performance measure. It's awesome. The health side of the ledger though, and the research is fairly clear that 
it triggers you know, certain pathways. One of them is mTOR, which is a growth pathway. And if it's triggered a lot, it, it has an effect on lifespan. It shortens lifespan, right? So the evidence, the literature would say this, a decrease in mTOR activation is linked with an increase in lifespan, mm. right? So if we just think about that for a moment, we're revving the engine hot, right? That's okay from time to time. But if I define my entire experience on that alone and I keep revving the engine hot, at a certain point in time, I got to ask the question, is it impairing and affecting my health mm. long term? Right. And that's the question. Right. And that's the idea of health and human performance. It doesn't mean we never do it. Of course we do it. But it's just what is the dose response? And, 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 and I know without sort of really upsetting people that have got businesses that do this, if you, if you, listen, if you listen to the approach that you've got, it sounds like, OK, you, you're going to it's like, a, I suppose, a, a meal on your on your sort of plate on your table you kind of you got a little bit of everything and and whereas some of the fitness products it's almost like well look you've just you've just got this whole plate of broccoli and and that's all you're kind of having and yeah. i don't know this is a great example but it's actually a, a good example and it, you know are we i suppose by some of the products that we're creating or these concepts that we're creating where it is just here um are we sort of confu- are, we, are we sort of leading the consumer down the wrong road because really if you, if you are going to do that sort of boutique style then really what you need is someone to say to you well yeah okay there's five different boutiques what you need to do is you, you need this one here you need that one there you need that one there and and then you've sort of figured it out as opposed to people thinking well, I'm going to just go and do that two times a week and I'm I'm yeah. sorted I think you raise a couple of good points there I think you raised that the fact that let's be respectful for those folks that have kind of put their 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 business into that camp. And I think any one of those individuals would not necessarily espouse that you should come in every day and do this every day. Uh, So there is a dose response. And that dose response is different for different people. So if I run a boutique that is high intensity, that's great, right? There's definite gains. And so what we talked about as certain pathways of bigger, stronger, that's true. Hmm. So, you you know, that that, uh, narrative... And communicating that narrative is powerful because people want that. They want to be bigger, stronger, faster. Yeah. And there's a, from what you said, there's a place. It's for, all about dosage. Yeah. yeah right. So right. you could say vitamin C is awesome until I take too much of it. Then it's detrimental to my health. Same thing. Right. And so hit high intensity is awesome. It's just, if that's all we do, then that's like taking too much vitamin C. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so what I think the opportunity, if I'm owning that facility that is you know, putting my stamp on high intensity and really that's part of our ethos and our DNA. Great. Can I actually offer some recovery Mm. in there so that I can show the individual the journey of how this high intensity can be sustained for much longer so I can sustain the bigger, stronger, faster gains for longer. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is an opportunity because it's never binary. It's not that, oh, that's bad. No. It's great. Right. But vitamin C is great too, until we take too much of it or too little of it. Mm. Right. And so it's just, what is that balance? And if people can take a look at how they can define the health experience, it is an advantage, right? Mm. Because what they do is they elevate what they stand for and saying, here is where it has its place. Yeah. And here's how you navigate all these other things. So you can keep doing what we do and what we advocate for, for longer. Yeah. And I think that's the opportunity. But that, that's not, that isn't sold uh, you know, that's not the message, is it? You know, no, because it's, you know, perhaps it's business and marketing, right? And we're looking at physiological outcomes yeah. too, right? And I, and I guess also you'll, you'll have, you know, and I've, like I say, we, we, we've done this, been guilty for these types of things, but I suppose you get an idea and it's like a lot of people like it and they're going and then, you know, let's just open 50 of these things. And Matt, our, our, the health experience, like <laughs> think of our industry, like you can actually track it from the beginning. And say, oh yeah, that was, you know, we can, whether it's styles or certain types of training, and we've mapped it in our existence. Oh yeah, I remember that 10 years ago. We used to do all that. And then, you know, five years prior to that, we did all of that. And so we tend to, like you said, we tend to shift. And what we want to do is to say, these are great, but let's expand our view so that we can actually navigate health and human performance. So if you if you had, had to start, you know, if the fitness industry didn't exist and you had a blank piece of paper and it's like, look, not necessarily what's just best for business, but it will be. But what what how would you, 
and, and you could you could have like boutiques and big boxes, but if in terms of like the entry point for the consumer, what would be the ideal type of guidance, advice, and sort of, and potential solutions that people would have that don't know anything about it? In its simplest way, and we've talked about this before, you might have uh, a an ecosystem that allows for stress and recovery. In its basic first level, right? There is a place where you stress the body and there is a place where you recover. Now within stress, we can stress it in different ways, right? We can do it with intensity or not. We can do it with mechanical load or not. So, you know, we can, have, or we can have places with all that present. Mm -hmm. And then we have places of recovery. And so if I went into a, a, an ecosystem that allowed for stress and recovery physically, that would increase my preparedness and that would increase my ability to be resilient and unbreakable while I achieve any goal that I want to achieve. Mm. And I think, you know, that's a simple way of answering that good question, but on its simplest level, that would be where we would have to start. Mm. And what a lot of people are like, probably listening to this, are like, ah, oh, I don't, I don't agree with that. You know, it's a nice idea. He's selling education, blah, blah, blah. What, what would back up what you've just said then? You know, what, what would, what would support your argument that that is, you know, I don't know, there's no, there's no, there's always different ways of doing it, but what you've, what you've just said, you know, why is that something that at least we should open our minds up and explore further then maybe is a better way of putting it. Yeah. If we look at just the physiological processes, well, let me back up. I think that if someone is dissenting against what I'm saying, awesome. <laughs> I think as long as the, is, is the, ex as long as the exchange is respectful and substantive, I think that that is valuable. Mm. Um, that's sharing best practices. And so that would be the first thing. And then the second thing would be how I might look at this and how I might defend that viewpoint would be it is important to understand that at, at the end of the day, we are dealing with a biological structure. And that biological structure is going to bend and then it's going to recover and it's going to supercompensate and then it's going to bend like stress. Then it's going to recover. Then it's going to supercompensate. And that happens through a lifespan. And so what we need to understand is that, well, how do we stress the system and how do we recover it? Because that is the training, that is the ad adaptation effect. Hmm. I mean, that's exactly what happens. And so, you know, we can argue how we go about doing that and we can argue methodologies and, and viewpoints and styles. And that's the art of program design. And that's cool. But at the end of the day, there is a stressor, there is a response and a series of responses over time is an adaptation. Hmm. And, and it could be a maladaptation too. If all we do is sit all day long, our body is going to adapt to that in probably not a, a great and, and a sustainable way, but it'll adapt. It'll always adapt to whatever environment we're giving it to because it's a series of responses. Mm. And so if we look at that from that level, then we can say, all right, so you know, what, in, what inputs do we want to put into our physical being? Uh, mental being, emotional being, social being, these are all... Uh, determinants of health. And then once we can consider that, these aspects will all commingle to create a health outcome. And if it's not the health outcome we want, then, you know, we go back and rejig things and then away we go. Mm. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's about stress and recovery and that balance between the two. Mm. You, you, you obviously, obviously know a lot of people and operators in, in the space. Are, are you seeing many people doing this is you know is this a lot more popular than what probably i've noticed or are, do, you, do you think we're still sort of at the beginning of just you know this starting to take hold as, a, as an idea no i think it is i think it really i think there is an opportunity if we're if we're in the fitness industry and we're future proofing ourselves we're not necessarily just um we're not just selling stress we might be selling stress and recovery and what's helping us is, the, you know, the people I talked to about before, which is, you know, the Tom Brady's and the Serena Williams's of the world, because they're doing something to create longevity in their mm. career. And they're shining a light on this idea of building a bigger bucket through recovery. And so people, are, consumers are now asking questions about that. Well, how are they doing it? And I heard, I heard, you know, if I do this little thing here and if I take this, you know, particular uh, intervention over here, you know, it's going to increase my capacity. They're asking about these types of things. So there are boutiques that are coming up, even in LA, that are pushing the narrative of we're going to accelerate recovery. Right? You come into our facility, we're accelerate recovery. Great. Um, but I think even the big boxes are starting to take notice. And there's two things that are happening. 
We can sell now a plan that is not just stress, but stress and recovery. And then we can also not just offer personal training, but health coaching. And that can be another ancillary service that can actually future proof a business mm -hmm. because it's not predicated on steel and mortar, right? We can health coach at a distance, right? And if it's part of a DNA of, a, of an individual, of a club chain, uh, that future proofs them, particularly with what we're exposed to now, which is closures. And now I can't really touch the brand in terms of going into the facility. Um, and, you know, that becomes an existential threat for, you know, for businesses that are, their business model is hinged on that. Mm. And what about trainers? I, I guess, you know, some trainers are probably doing okay at the moment because they've found another area of business. But for the ones that have been laid off and think, well, I really like this industry, um, I, I, you know, I love helping people. What, what advice would you give to some of these young people that are, you know, not quite knowing what to do and, um, you know, based on your experience and where you see the opportunities, what, what, what would you say to them? Well, there's the obvious one is, is the virtual space. I mean, that's the obvious one, right? So getting proficient in how to communicate and deliver workouts and, and recovery through the virtual space. I mean, that would be one. And the other one really is health coaching, right? So you know, when you look at health coaching, it is really about um, taking an individual through a health experience where you serve as a guide by their side. And it's, it's about lifestyle and behavior change. And that is much more, it's less fitness facing and it's much more healthcare facing now. Because there is, even is, you know, um, if you take a look at reimbursement codes through healthcare, uh, the CPT3 codes are starting to change as of January of this year. And they're taking a look at how the idea of prevention and coaching within prevention can be even remunerated by healthcare. So mm. if you're interested out there as a fitness professional and you love helping folks, that's one area that you really want to, you know, keep a keen eye on because it allows a couple of things. It allows you to help people and it allows you to help people not necessarily live every time because there's a, you know, there's a coaching exchange. It might be through text or email or, you know, some, in, some virtual uh, interactions as well. But a lot of those nudges and a lot of those coaching elements are served throughout the day, throughout the week. And that could be served from like an eight to four type of job. And one of the things that trainers lament when they get older is this, I got to get up at 5 a.m. for my first clients, and then there's a break in the day, and then I got to stay for my after work crowd. And that's great if you're a gym rat and you're 26 and you love the gym, but at 36, when you've got a young family, it's a different deal. And a lot of trainers at that point make a decision to get mm -hmm. out. They love working with people, but it's just not sustainable in terms of the hours and everything else. And so health And coaching, also the income, I guess, because they're not probably, you know, they're not the value that they're offering is probably not what it could be if they tapped into health yeah. as opposed to just... Right. And, and so that would be an area that I would, I would suggest, I would really offer up for those folks mm -hmm. that are interested in continuing to help people and wondering if there is, you know, some sort of uh, career after mm -hmm. or, or, you know, let's say, you know, a step forward uh, as they navigate, uh, you know, their careers. And how do they, I, I guess they've got to acquire new knowledge to do that. Yeah, so there's certifications out there. So you can go through Well Coaches, Ace. I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, health coaching certifications. So you can become a certified or a board certified health coach. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing a lot of these projects overseas right now. And as a certified or board certified health coach, now you've got the, you know, the designation, you've got the training to stay within your scope of practice and assist people through the health experience. And that is in fitness and then it's, you know, risk providers, health insurance companies, um, you know, these types of entities uh, are all engaging in the health coaching experience. Mm. And what do you see for what, in terms of the future then? And we obviously talked a lot about new ideas, but do you, in, you know, in the future and business opportunities, do you, do you see that um, things are going to go more virtual than what they probably have been in the past or do you think there'll be more of a blended like you say you'll have this life coach or health coach that will help you online and then you go to the gym for some of the stuff how do you I do believe that I think you know I think gyms you know they're gonna have to navigate a lot of unknowns I mean none of us have a crystal ball but I think that you know the idea of a shared economy being a gym is still a thing and in certain sectors it's an innovative thing right you know we're gonna just utilize and, and commonly use you know a lot more than what we could use ourselves. Uh, that I think will still be in play once people have the confidence to return. Uh, and so how gyms navigate that space between now and then is, you know, that, that's going to be 
um, you know, for the industry to decide and figure out. Um, I think that's a big, you know, just on that point, that, that certainly seems to be a burning question that a lot of people have. You know, what do I do with my sort of 30 to 40% of people that are on hold that don't feel safe to come back in? What do we do about how do we keep engaging with them, communicating yeah. with them, helping yeah. them? Yeah, and I mean, the health coach piece would be, yeah. right, if that infrastructure was in place. Yeah. But I think that a lot of gyms are going to start to look at that as a skew for their ancillary services because it's an addition. It doesn't replace anything else. It's right. in addition to, right? So what, that, what it does do is it allows their staff and their organization, their brand, to be able to touch the members, right, in real time yeah. and offer care, not just when they're in the facility, but as a process of health development. And I think you got to. I, I think that takes thinking of things differently because when you think of recovery, you think, "Well, that's the dad don't go to the gym," um, and and you don't. I suppose when I think of recovery, it's like, "Well, you just you just don't do anything." Yeah. But I, I guess the way you've explained it, and I, I guess it's a nice marketing model, but there's more to recovery than just not turning up to a gym. You, you know, got it. <laughs> yeah. and I, and I suppose that from a business perspective is a product in itself. Right. So if we go back to our decision tree, is it a workout day or work in day? Right, workout day is a mechanical metabolic. We went through that. If it's a work in day, here's our three decisions. Is it in the gym work in? Well, I'll give you an example in a second. Is it a full day of recovery? And I'll give you an example, or is it a day off? Those are the three decisions that you would make if your first decision was it's a work in day. So if it's in the gym, I can go in and do um, some, uh, you know, some, let's say some body, some, some let's say some joint uh, strengthening exercises. Um, you know, things like, you know, vibration guns, rollers, uh, compression garments, all of these things are in the gym things that are recovery based techniques that are out there like Aldo and FRC are great techniques for joint strengthening. We're bulletproofing our body by actually not necessarily sweating a whole ton, but by going into the gym. So in other words, you and I might be going into a devoted work in session in the gym. And we're working on joint mechanics and, and, you know, small motor unit recruitment, which just means I'm strengthening the joints. I'm doing some body work in terms of rolling. I'm doing some compression garments. I might be doing some vibration stuff. And that, may, that whole process can be engineered. Let's say it's 45 minutes. You and I leave the gym and we're hardly sweating. And people go, man, you didn't really work out. But we leave the gym feeling bulletproof, mm. like unbreakable. And accomplished as well because you... Unbreakable, just... <laughs> right? Because you're building that tank, right? Yeah. And I do this. I never work out myself. I never work out stress two days in a row. So I'll do something almost every day. But it's usually a stress recovery, stress recovery, typically. And so when I go to the gym and do my in the gym recovery day, it's usually about 45 to 60 minutes. And... From the outside, it looks like Michelle's not doing much. Not, not, not a lot of sweat and not a lot of working out. But when I leave the gym that day, I feel bulletproof, right? And that builds the capacity mm. Mm. to be able to, you know, do what I want for as long as I want to do it. Mm. And I think that's, I think the tilting of our mindset is that we are engineering a, a health experience in a way that just speaks to both sides of the ledger. Yeah. And so if it's a day of recovery, that is, you know, a, whole, a, hot, a hot, cold shower in the morning, followed by this, followed by... So it could be not that that's all I'm doing, but there are certain, you know, gaps in the day that I'm just pulling out and I'm filtering it into my, my let's say, my work day. And so it's a day devoted to recovery. So it could start with a hot, cold contrast shower. Then it could start with some eye tracking exercise following that. And then I go to work. And then during the day, I'm getting 10 minutes of sun on my skin and on my face with no sunglasses on because of, you know, vitamin D being expressed because of the absorption of UVB, UVB light. I'm relevant to our friends in England, yeah. by the way. <laughs> it's, it, it's something called sun. <laughs> you may have heard of it. Um, and then, that, you know, that triggers tryptophan hydroxylase, which is a rate limiting enzyme that, that converts, uh, you know, vitamin D and tryptophan into serotonin. And serotonin is a neurotransmitter that affects all sorts of different recovery mechanisms. So, you know, by example, we can just do that. Right. And that's a whole day of specific modalities of recovery that, again, you know, increase the capacity of our being and make us unbreakable. Mm. And that's the difference between going in and working out or human performance. Uh, yeah, certainly, I, I guess from what you've said, you know, it, it, fitness, working out is 
you know, is, is a slither. If it was a, if it's a pie, you know, it's kind of this small slither that I feel that we're missing out on on a big part of the pie. Yeah, and there's a there is an opportunity to narrate this, and there's a there's an opportunity to future proof uh, if we're organizations within fitness, and using this time to really redefine what we stand for and how we can actually um, we can reach our customers and serve them in different facets, still within the fitness and health umbrella, uh, but that safeguard, you know, potential enterprise risks, which mm. we're seeing right now, right? Yeah. Which is, you know, it's mandated that the doors of your facility shut down. Now what? Yeah. Right. That's an enterprise risk. Yeah. And so to offset that, that, you don't have to pivot at all. It's not even a pivot. It's just an add on of, okay, how do we contextualize? Yeah, how do we add on well. an ancillary service that allows us now to become, you know, stewards of health and human performance and be able to do that inside and outside our facility. I think that's a good point. You know, everyone's like, well, how do we pivot? How do we pivot? You know, new business models. But I think, again, what you're saying is it's like, no, this is just building on. This is just building on what you've got. Maybe slightly different in terms of how and where you deliver it, but it's, it's layering on more, um, you know, uh, yeah, might layer on more skills and, and uh, I suppose a better, better service, isn't it? I suppose. You're looking at the entire map. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's um, it, it's out of all the ones I've had, it's a very refreshing conversation for the fitness space. That's for sure. It's because we're in Solana Beach, man. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it's it's made me think. And I, I hope a lot of people, you know, I hope a lot of people hear this, um, and it sort of gets them ex- as excited as what I am. There's, you know, we've really skimmed over the top of a of a ton of information. If people want to find out more about it, what are the different ways? You know, do you, have you got consulting where you can sort of talk to people who have got businesses about doing this? Do you do training? What, what yeah, do you we do. do. Uh, you know, for our IOM business, we, we are an applied health and human performance company. And we steer that towards fitness, healthcare, and, and performance. But healthcare, we're not talking medical. We're talking about prevention. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if we go to www.instituteemotion.com, you can see some information on there. And, you know, we, we are lucky that we have a lot of colleagues within fitness but years ago, we, we didn't pivot away from fitness at all. Fundamentally, what we did from our research to who we hired to the academics that we have as, as part of our team, we've got uh, four PhDs on our team. Uh, our fundamental tenant is health and human performance or health and fitness. And when we bring that context to life, it shapes our thinking. And what we start to do is we start to fundamentally see things differently, right? And, and that could be services that a fitness club offers even. We see mm. that differently too. Mm. So. so final question, Michelle. And I, you know, one of the if people want to go back and listen to the earlier interview we did with you. They can sort of hear your background and everything. But it, it, over the last six months, Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed as impossible and gone on to make it possible. Um, what, what, what would be one of the examples of where you've probably shifted your thinking or, or your sort of limits about, you know, what, what's possible or what's happened and, and probably, you know, change your mindset and thought differently, specifically as it relates to the recent period. I think the limiting belief that we held, that we held, like that I held, that we held as a, as a, as a team, as a group, as a business, uh, was that, you know, fitness or prevention kind of health was restricted to those enthusiasts uh, that themselves volitionally, you know, kind of lean into it, right? There's, I chose to do this and I want to do this. And, and I think that was really our self-limiting belief is that, okay, we're going to engage those folks. But uh, through the recent past, what we've had the great pleasure to do is work with government organizations uh, abroad. Uh, we've worked with risk pools and what we've, what it, is allowed us to now see very clearly is that the idea, and we talked about this before, the idea of a health span within a person's lifespan has to include uh, elements within the fitness and health industry that are absolutely within the scope of practice that need to be at the table. And a lot of times we just kind of self-marginalize ourselves as an industry, don't we? We just mm-hmm. thought, okay, well, we'll, we'll take care of these folks that want to lean in themselves. But I think that the idea of, and what we, profess and hold to be true are, you know, th- you know, the same things, which is a bunch of folks that want to help people, uh, enthusiasm and passion for health and well-being, right? 
a zeal to reach out and you know to create a community, this communal experience. Uh, the idea of yes, competition, but cooperation as well, and and fellowship. Like all of these things ring true for you know every person to manage a life that has high well-being. Hmm. And that is absolutely within our purview. Even in the global discussion of health care, right? It's really not about sick care, it's health care. And, you know, although we believe that that is true, I think what we've, ourselves, what we've come to realize is that we have a major seat at the table when it comes to these discussions and how to shape the arc of how this may impact folks out there. Hmm. Well, Michelle, thank you so much. That wasn't at all what I expected us to talk about today, but I'm glad we did. I think it's fantastic, and I recommend, if you can, share this to anyone in the space, because there's... Um... Was it going to be stout beer? Is that what we're going to talk about? <laughs> That's right, yeah. Nothing what I thought. There's some, uh, there's some really wonderful information there. I recommend listening to it several times, and I'm sure it will uh, make a difference to your business. Well, listen, we, we appreciate you too. We, I know you, you do all these things either virtually as of late or you know, live in the past, and so thank you for, for doing what you're doing and, and bringing an eclectic group of folks together and having a, a, just a really good conversation. So well done and well done to you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.